is Thursday morning. It's 9.30 a.m. here in Europe, and it's Space Cafe time, or Space Cafe Law Breakfast with Stephen Freeland will begin very soon. Thanks for joining us for our breakfast roundtable today. You see this wonderful location here in Bonn. We came together, and we will know you will know all about that in a bit. As always, we really appreciate you appreciate your participation and ongoing feedback and you see it's very early and i didn't have my second coffee yet so i'm ah, Horsten, ah. the publisher of spacewatch.global and we are a europe-based online platform for information in and about space and new space activities in a geopolitical context i would like to thank all our private and corporate supporters that showed their commitment to keep our independent journalism alive and we really appreciate that in case you want to join our supporter team be aware it's just a click away on our website and i know many of you are familiar with our website our bi-weekly or daily newsletters this morning you might have received a bi-weekly newsletter but also the space cafe podcast so don't miss the last episode uh, with featured alexander leindecker and egbert edelberg about sex in space the untapped conversations and you might, <laughs> might ask yourself hey why is that if we want to be a space-faring nation or a space-faring species we have to reproduce on other planets how will that work you will hear all about it in that episode but we also have new episodes on our space cafe radio with simon flag and chris troa are about the space Port Norway, uh, Spaceport um, Andoya, or Maxime Putul from Euroconsult, and a new series of the Space Factor in Italian language with G Giovanni Labini. You can find more of the audios on all of your podcast platforms. And if you want to become a space watcher and let the world know about your cool t shirt, as you can see, with Stephen Freeland or your Mac, visit our fan shop. It's open on our website all time. And if you've missed any of our previous web talks, we have an archive available on our web page in the events section and also on YouTube. So we will host our Space Cafe Law Breakfast with Stephen Freeland on a almost bi-monthly base. We are now in episode number 15. So we really kept this frequency and we hope to do that also in the future. With that, I'm handing over to your host in Sydney today, Professor Stephen Freeland, Stephen, the floor is yours. Thank you, dear friend. Hello, everybody. Um, it's lovely to see you. Yes, I'm here in uh, sunny Sydney, and uh, um, I'm sitting on land that has been the land of our Indigenous people for 65,000 years. Can you imagine? 65,000 years, our Australian Indigenous people are known um, as the world's first astronomers. And there's so much that we, as lawyers, diplomats, uh, governance people, can learn from the Indigenous perspectives of the space. So welcome again. Hey, Torsten, 15 programs. I think we both deserve a little pat on the back um, for this little experiment that now has grown into a bit of a, a beach ball from a little yeah. gra grain of sand. And uh, it just gets better and better. And today we're just going to have a fantastic time, I think, with uh, wonderful guests. Um, I'll introduce them in a minute. Um, but as people will know, and maybe you're new to our program, um, the idea here is not to go into the detail of law and give lectures or anything like that. But really, and the word that Torsten and I like using is demystify, demystify and bring to reality what is happening in space and how governance and regulation and responsible behaviours can and should and indeed must be utilised if we are to continue to garner those wonderful benefits from space. So we've got great experts um, today, Anne Vandenbrecker and Martin Reinders, um, who will tell us so much that we need to know about really, really important questions. Um, we'll come to that, but 
as Torsten said, we are in a really unique place. This is, I think, Torsten, our first standing breakfast. Is that right? I mean, normally we sit down in comfortable cafes together. Yeah, I think we, we're we standing have, up today. We, we have been sitting <laughs> yeah. around the uh, India Gate um, one, so outside. Oh, that's so true. We had a picnic. We had a picnic. Yeah, a picnic, that's right. But it's yeah. still on the, on the floor. But here we are. We had to stand. Yeah. So, but it is worse. <laughs> but it is worth it. So let's find out where we are. Um, and one of our guests, Martin, Martin Randers, has invited us to Bonn. Uh, welcome, Martin. Um, tell us where we are. Yes, uh, thank you, Stephen. So we are meeting at the Bundesbüchen, uh, as, as you can see above all our heads, uh, the, the, the red writing. Um, it's a, a rather small newspaper and, and coffee shop, uh, but it has a history. Um, it uh, was set up um, in Bonn, uh, when Bonn was still the capital of Germany, um, until uh, the unification, uh, reunification. Then in 1999, the seat of government and, and the parliament moved to Berlin, but from uh, 1949 until then, Bonn was a, a German capital, and uh, this uh, is the place where all the parliamentarians and some ministers and chancellors uh, got their coffee, their newspapers, or, or their, their breakfast. And uh, for example, uh, the, the chancellor, uh, Helmut Kohl, which uh, some of the older might know, um, was uh, uh, known that, that he sent his driver to get some, some breakfast for him. Um, at, at the <laughs> Bundesbüchen, and uh, but it's not just uh, about the past. Uh, so nowadays, the former parliamentary building, um, which you can you can see in the back, this white thing on on the right hand side, um, it is um, now the UN campus, and uh, behind it, in in the old. Um, um, the, in the old plenary hall, there's the World Conference Center Bonn now. And the UN campus in Bonn hosts, uh, among others, uh, the UN Spider office, um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> which is uh, <clears throat> about um, the uh, space-based uh, information for disaster reduction. And um, in 2008, the World Conference Center hosted the Unispace Plus 50 conference, so the high-level forum. And um, that uh, will not be the last uh, big UN event uh, in Bonn, uh, because I can uh, tell you that we are planning um, to have the World Space Forum 2024 in Bonn again, and uh, to be uh, held at the World Conference Center right next to the UN campus in December 2024. Wow, so that we'll all be standing where we're standing now in 2024, there'll be a whole conference. <laughs> all lined up yeah <laughs> exactly then, then we can have a coffee there in person but it's december um don't, don't, don't forget <laughs> that it might be chilly and cold but yeah, well well i don't know uh torsten do you think the current chancellor when uh when he walks past the bundesbüchen when he's in bonn says wow look there's torsten creamy standing over there uh having you know you're you're well known in those circles as well, aren't you? No, but it, it, it's Bonn, and as Martin pointed out, it was the former capital, and I always lived in the real capital. Of <laughs> uh, but okay, it's, even it, it, it's just a Bonn Berlin thing. So, but <sighs> yeah, we we have a similar thing here with Sydney and Melbourne. Martin, thank you, thank you. I'll introduce you formally in a minute. But uh, in this really wonderful surroundings, we're going to examine some really important issues and um, Anne and Martin will really help us go through. We're, we're going to look at things about technology and space. So um, as the technological paradigm for space continually changes, uh, we're going to discuss in what ways the international framework needs to be augmented to take account of that changing framework. Uh, we're gonna talk about how do we educate the regulators, regulators who are typically not technical people, but that they have to, in a sense, govern the, uh, a paradigm where it's all about the technology changing. 
We're going to talk about capacity building. We're going to talk about AI and how that works and how do we delve into issues about accountability. So these are really challenging issues. And we've got wonderful guests, uh, my dear friend, Martin Randis, and my new friend, Anne van den Bricke. It's uh, lovely to have you both. Let me briefly introduce both. Both, um, Firstly, Anne, welcome. Anne is uh, the Chief Regulatory Officer at uh, a wonderful company called Rivada Space Network. She'll talk a little bit about that. She has got a wealth of space experience. Rivada itself is a German-based company that's building a large constellation. I think you said 600 low Earth orbit satellites that ultimately will provide um, a network for high security uh, within space with high throughput in orbit. Um, and had experience at many other places uh, responsible for global market access spectrum. She's got in-depth experience on the ITU and really a wonderful, wonderful brain to pick from, if you if you like. And welcome, and thank you so much. And Martin, who uh, who many of you will know in from the COPOS uh, um, regime, Martin's legal advisor and deputy head of UN affairs at the German Space Agency at the DLR. He works on both national and international law questions and their interaction. Um, he deals with international space law and registration. <laughs> studied at Cologne uh, with my dear friend uh, Stefan Horber. Um, worked for the uh, Institute of Air Law, Space Law and Cyber Law. Participated in the Manfred Lax Moot Court competition. And then worked um, as a research assistant and author for the wonderful book project, The Cologne Commentaries on space law. If you don't have a set of those, you must get them. They are the go-to books uh, when it comes to analyzing the treaties. Um, after that was finished, he did his clerkship um, in the local court, in the prosecutor's office in Köln, with the foreign ministry, with Bayer Crop Science, the German Space Agency, and in 2019 joined the UN Affairs. So welcome both of you, um, it's such a delight and pleasure to be sharing breakfast with you. So our next tradition, you're all aware, but uh, this is in a sense, the most important part of what it is to talk about space and the wonders of space. So as everybody knows, each time we ask our special guests, give us one word to describe space. You'll see on the screen, Torsten has put in some of the words from previous guests. You'll see, for example, Torsten, uh, the, the person that he is, uh, his word for space is ambiguous, which I think is always uh, an interesting word. Mine was intergenerational, but you see there are many, many um, words. And Torsten and I are already talking about putting a, a little book together where we're going to get everybody to talk about their word and, and we'll circulate that. I think the one word for space is important. So Anne, welcome, welcome. It's a delight to have you. If you could describe the wonders of space in one word, what word would you choose? Well, my my word would be eternal. Eternal in two senses. Eternal in sense of eternal flame, and uh, also in in the mm -hmm. sense of space yet has to last an eternity. Um, so, of course, space yet has to last an eternity. That, um, particularly with the kind of constellation we put up, is front and center of our of our thinking. Um, we need to use it in a very responsible way. You see, we're wearing green, which is a very, very good uh, good color. We're describing our our uh, responsible attitude as that we want to implement the green constellation. So that's. Uh, in the regulatory field, something which is a major talking point. So from their point of view, eternal space yet has to last an eternity, but also eternal flame, because what you find in space is a lot of people with a lot of passion. Um, somehow working in space it sp speaks to the imagination. It gives people a drive. Um, it, um, it makes people 
really passionate about what, what they're doing. And the reason for that is probably that, of course, it's super cool to work in space. Yeah. But there's also something a bit transcending, meaning like after we left the project or after we even have left this mortal coil, this life, um, there is something which is left behind. Um, you can look up to, into the sky and say, yeah, up there, there's a satellite. And right now, there may be a sailor who's in distress and who would have no other means of communication if I were, had not been part of a team of people that put that satellite up there. And, you know, it's, it's, making, it's making a real difference. So thinking of that gives a sense of purpose, a sense of longevity to what we have been accomplished uh, on Earth. And, and of course, I must say, Torsten, you gave a whole new sense of uh, to um, passion in space with your next talk about um, sex in space. But that was definitely not, that wasn't really why I had taken the, 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 word, the word eternal, but that's it. Well, they, that, that, they are such beautiful sentiments, Anne, and uh, I think everybody who's listening um, is moved by your, your passion as well. So uh, may that live eternally as well. So thank you for that. Martin, um, you, you've got some interesting thoughts about your word, because uh, I know we've shared this already before the program. What is your word for the wonders of space? Uh, well, I picked the uh, revolutionary. Um, it was not my first choice because I think it's a bit over the top, uh, but um, the other ones were take <laughs> the the less drastic ones. <laughs> and and when when I looked, uh, so so the reason was that um, if if you look at space, not just the technology, but also mm -hmm. space law, um, it has fundamentally changed quite a few things. Um, uh, talking about the law, who would have thought of uh, absolute liability in international law before the liability convention was discussed, that, that was quite new, um, uh, or absolute liability without any cap, uh, that was quite new. Um, and um, also, like there, there's this uh, Latin maxim, which I will not bore you by reading out completely no, no, no. Usually Go. refer to uh, uh, well okay cuius <laughs> est solum eus est usque at colum et at inferos so usually referred wow. to as the uh, at colum doctrine uh, meaning that that if you if you belong property it belongs to you from the uh, center of the earth up to the or from 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 the ground um up to the skies uh, and that was changed uh, or it was challenged by the way space technology works and then uh, people agreed that there's no sovereignty over outer space as there is in airspace and um, but you, you can call those like little revolutions and and what I discovered what I what I really liked was that um, already uh, Nicolas Copernicus uh, wrote a book about uh, De Revolutionibus Orbium Colestium so, so he used the, the the Latin phrase where revolutionary comes from, and I mean that's the the old uh, meaning of um, revolving. So things revolving around the earth, um, which uh, made me uh, come to terms with that uh, word, which was not my first choice. Well, thank you. I mean, for something that's not your first choice, you've given us so many interesting reasons why it's such an important word and. You're right. I mean, space has revolutionized all of our lives. Every person on the planet is touched by space. It's revolutionized the way that uh, the world and humanity lives. So I think it's a great word. Thanks. Thanks, Martin. Um, OK, with all of that in mind, let's delve into some of uh, some of the really sensitive issues. And, you know, we're obviously in this paradigm where space is continuing to grow as technology grows, as, pardon me, the number of actors grow and the benefits that we can potentially gain um, are, are there for the taking as long as we do it in a responsible way. Um, Technology is changing, and uh, we've you know got companies like Rivada Networks and many others 
that are really seeking to bring us forward with new types of technology, with leapfrogging in above where we are. So Martin, as you know, and you know, you're an expert in this, you know, the fundamental legal principles of the treaties developed through COPLOS, and obviously COPLOS and you are synonymous with each other. Um, they're very familiar. Um, we, you and I both agree, of course, that those principles serve us really well, but clearly in this changing, I was gonna say evolution, but maybe this changing revolution of space, means that we've got to continually look to ways to complement the principles with guidance and standards. So where do you see, as, a, as really an expert in this, where do you see the most important areas that we need to focus on, given that we can't do everything, uh, for, for additional international governance instruments or rules of the road, really as the technology develops? Um, well, from, from what we see now with an increase in, in space activities of all kinds, it's, it's really about the managerial aspect um, to achieve the, the broadest freedom for all. It means, uh, as lawyer, you, you often say that, that freedom ends where it impairs the freedom of others. So uh, to, to balance those interests out, um, you have to find some um, <clears throat> common grounds uh, on, on which you act. And um, I believe that uh, in outer space, since it's, um, it's, it's just a global commons, uh, as, as people say, and, and um, the, the Outer Space Treaty speaks of the benefits for all countries, uh, irrespective of their development and so on. Um, we have to come to those conclusions uh, ideally in, in copious, so, so on a multilateral level and not just by, by regional corporations, um, because everyone has, has to adhere to the same rules. And uh, I would say that, that the most uh, pressing issues or most, most uh, important topics right now are, are space traffic management, mm -hmm. um, in, including questions of, of debris mitigation and uh, space resources um, and uh, yeah, so, so, so I, I would like to, to define or have an understanding of space traffic management which is very broad so it's uh, about collision avoidance of course uh, especially talking about constellations and, and the growing number of, of satellites in LEO um, but then it's also rules for rendezvous and proximity operations uh, which might touch a bit more on, on the security aspects and, and transparency and confidence building measures. Um, I already mentioned um, <clears throat> debris mitigation, but uh, ultimately we have to think about some kind of uh, orbit or orbital plane allocation uh, in, in other um, orbits than the geostationary orbit where, where we already have slot allocations. Um, to ensure that, that we sustainably use outer space and that it will still be possible for future generations um, to set up constellations or whatever new technologies uh, they endeavor. And uh, if, if you look at, at plans about uh, going back to the moon uh, and such, uh, it, it's really important to keep uh, the, the low Earth orbit um, or let's keep the low Earth orbit from being saturated so that you can safely travel through uh, the low Earth orbit. Wow, yeah, I, I think all of those issues are, are so important. Um, uh, I'm glad you mentioned resources because I think, you know, there's so much excitement in all of that. And as you know, you and I liaise quite a lot on that in a more formal basis, but space traffic management is so important, you know, and I think space traffic management will also need to include components of air traffic management. I mean, we really need to have a holistic view of what we're talking about. But you focused on low Earth orbit, and that's, you know, that brings me to Anne. Um, you know, you work, Anne, you're working for a company that's uh, establishing a fleet of satellites in low Earth orbit. You've got this wonderful technology of interconnecting communications. Um, but you need you need legal certainty from the the regulators that you're operating under. 
but you need to explain to those regulators what it is you're doing. You know, when you and I had a conversation offline before and you were explaining to me exactly how Rivada operates, I had to ask you really basic questions because it's difficult for someone with a non-technical background to understand. And so I'm really interested in how you, because you, you are the bridge between, if you like, the governance side and the technical side, how do operators like your company, like you, explain and bring the, the non-technical regulators along the journey with you? They need to govern your activities, they need, but they need to understand your activities. And yet they need to put in place at least some sort of rules, even before you've completed your project and you're that you're fully functioning. So what's the process? How how do you how do you bring the regulators along with you so that you can continue? But as Martin says, we're doing things with sustainable eyes, if you like. Yes. yes. <clears throat> well, yes, uh, um one of the 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 people. Who works with an operator who has the the task of marrying the laws of man with the laws of physics and and actually it's it's worse than that because it's a marriage with three because ultimately it's also for the company to that it needs to be done um taking into the account the realities of economics so uh, this is a task that that definitely is um, as, um, as 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 challenging as it is rewarding. It's it's challenging because there are different levels of regulation to take into account that operate in different institutions who have very different mindsets, very different objectives, and just very different perspectives. If you go to the ITU environment where it's about orbital positions, making filings, um, um, mitigation for interference. That's um, a universe in itself. And it's very, very, very important for a satellite operator. If you have no slots, you have no, you can't put your satellites up. It's as simple as that. If you have no filings, and of course the priority of the filing is, it's you know, it's a, a lot. It's a skill in itself that. So you got the 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 ITU world. You also have the UN world, Martin. So well spoke about. I don't need to say add much to 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 that. But that has a very very different mindset. It's more of a UN mindset. It's more a, a, a commons a, and 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 the enforceability of their rules also differs very, very, very much. And then, of course, you have the layer of market access. It's not sufficient you have slots, you have filings, you have associated spectrum, and that you have your licenses to put your, your satellites up in space. You need to have the rights to commercialize, and that is something you need to achieve country by country. So we have th three very, very different groups mm. of institutions and approaches and it's a whole lot of people and a whole lot of uh, the world is the world and the universe are a big a big place so you need to you know you need to understand where, where people are coming from and that if you ask how do you do it apart from building a, a good team to help you and apart from having a good plan which you execute meticulously to to do all of that in time before you launch commercially the attitude is very, very, very important. It, if you have an, um, an attitude and you approach people in a regulator or a policy environment as uh, bureaucrats, it's the wrong start. I have huge respect for them because ultimately they are driven by policy goals. And that is where you can have a meeting of mind. You need to go as an operator to explain what this is about why we are doing this, what the common goal is, how our technology and our system can help to, uh, can facilitate the regulators and policymakers to ultimately achieve what drives them. And then the bureaucracy is a means 
to achieve that. So you start with the with with that mentality, um, and um, and then yes, you you have to you have to work through things. But when describing your technology, it's not about you know as I try to do with you to kind of impress you, which how, yeah. how super amazing. I am in, everything. I am impressed. When in, in the regulatory environment, when you talk about technology, it's it's about how the technology helps to address the very, very valid concerns regulators, regulators have. How you use your technology to actually be green, be sustainable, how you use your technology to retire risks very valid risks. Martin mentioned so so well, like security risks. Um, how can they how can they monitor systems? Um, we and and so if you describe the technology and say our network is geofenced, we have the capability to set technical envelopes on a country by country basis, and our network controls the terminals. That's the way to to um, to to describe the technology to, um, to, to, to regulators. So coming at it, so we have a meeting of mind at a policy level, and then using your, the, the, the description of technology to show how it retires the regulatory concerns and the risks they have. And, you know, and finally, um, Martin spoke so very well um, about, um, about UNQUAS and the value of uh, of of international organizations and I and and capacity building and I'm a staunch believer in that. I started my life working working life working five years for the European Communications Office, where I my full time job was to get 48 countries in a room and knock the heads together to try and harmonize <laughs> licensing licensing. Uh, so. Even though the one-stop shopping that resulted from that wasn't really a success, what was a success is that those people got to know each other really well and they exchanged experience among each other. It's no good for an operator to say, you know what, for us to, to allow us to make most, most money, this is the lightest regulation to implement. It, it's the wrong, it, it's not correct. That's not, that, that doesn't, doesn't cut it. But what is valuable is for regulators to come together. And, and I've seen firsthand when I worked at ETO and when all the ITU work I'm, I'm doing and work I did with the Commonwealth Telecommunication Union, how well peer-to-peer -peer, peer -peer capacity building is, is, is working. And it may seem like a big talking shop and that these international institutions are tigers without teeth. That may all very well be, but the unsung hero and resulting um, unsung results from those environments is the the capacity the, the the joint capacity capacity building yeah i couldn't agree with you more um we're having a debate in my country in australia just at the moment i mean it's a debate that in a sense you think this is this is, should be well understood already 20 years ago but it's a debate to convince our policymakers and our politicians that space when you know we're not doing things in space for the sake of doing things in space space is as you say an enabler for everything else that we can do on earth and and uh you know it it, it astounds me sometimes that people still haven't got that message through that space is I often give speeches and people say to me, well, oh, space, that's the future. And I say, no, 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 space is very much now. It's mainstream and we need it and it enables everything. So thank you. And I love your discussion about capacity building. So Martin, you are my guru expert on capacity building. You, know, you and I have had the pleasure of working together on various capacity building projects, particularly with the UNUSA people. And of course, Capacity building, as Anne says, is so important. It's obvious that we've got to uh, extend the knowledge base, the skill base amongst, in our case, a broader range of countries, but also, therefore, <laughs> that will filter down to their non-governmental entities. But each country is different, isn't it? I mean, you and I have um, been involved in capacity building with large company countries and small countries you know, industrialized countries who have got well-established space 
uh, programs and emerging countries or even some who have not even beginning. So what is the best way of developing capacity building given countries are different? Should we do it on a country by country basis or should we share our experiences amongst different countries or really is it a combination of both? So you work in capacity building a lot and you do such a great thing uh, in spreading that knowledge base. What's the best way to help countries and their constituents understand how space works, what's possible, what is appropriate and how they can move forward? Um, I, I think it, it really is both, um, as uh, you, you mentioned, as the, the, the last thing, because um, you, you need the basic understanding um, and, and it's a prerequisite to uh, then exchange experiences. So, um, for example, uh, on, on um, space object registration, um, if we were to go to countries and tell them that's the way we do it um, without explaining uh, the, the reasoning and, and the, the basic rules from uh, the registration convention, for example, um, they can after that just copy our approach, but they would not really have a clue why they are doing it. And uh, if, if you look at Germany, the, the National Registry for, for Space Objects is uh, annexed to the aircraft registry. That's for historic reasons, and, and it certainly made sense back then. But for every country who's now building it up from scratch, I think there are better options. And you really, so, so you need to, to first uh, have the, the capacity building in like, like a teaching style manner. Then, um, and once they, they know about uh, those um, uh, rules, requirements, and, and goals of registration, then you can start the um, sharing of experiences. And then they, if, if they hear about different experiences, they have the knowledge to, um, to evaluate that and to think about what is uh, best for us. And uh, then to, and they can make their own experiences if they have the basic knowledge and share those experiences. Um, and, and that's uh, equally important because uh, one, once you, you have the knowledge and, and you start uh, applying certain treaties or, or implementing registration, um, for example, uh, then it's, it's really important that you talk about those experiences and share those experiences to uh, ensure that uh, there's a common understanding because um, especially with space uh, object registration, states have to talk a lot nowadays because mm -hmm. you have this concept of the launching state with, which is very broad. And um, nowadays with just uh, a few countries offering uh, launch capabilities, but uh, a, a whole lot more of countries wanting to launch satellites, you uh, barely have one launching state. And those launching states have to talk to each other who registers a space object because there can be many launching states, but just one state of registry. And um, so it, they, they, it, it's easier to have those talks and to come to a conclusion who registers if you have a common understanding and you've shared experiences beforehand and you know a bit about the approach of another country um, in, in registration. And uh, then to, to come back to, to what I said earlier, um, the knowledge uh, about, about the basic rules and uh, the knowledge about uh, experiences own or, or those uh, heard from others is really important, especially for, for the emerging space fair nations and the new copious members to uh, participate in the discussions about and the further development of space governance which is uh, now now really important um, with the whole um, changing dynamic. Um, if you look at the treaties from uh, the 70s uh, or developed in the 60s even, um, you, you have a whole different range of actors now. I would not say that the treaties are outdated. It's uh, in the treaties that there can be private activities or non-governmental activities as the treaty calls it. 
but um, <clears throat> it's uh, more important than it was uh, 30 or 40 years ago that states have a common understanding how they want to regulate that, how they um, want to, to, to engage with uh, the private actors that they are responsible for. Yeah, and, and I think oh, if, go ahead. I, if yeah. I if I if I can pick up on that last point, that is just that is just so super important that there's a dialogue between the the in the, the environment of UNPOS and that is and and UN and and, and ITU and all of, of those international issues, but that there is a deep involvement of the private sector in and a deep participation and a dialogue um, be, involving also the private sector. Yeah, and it's, and it's really, uh, I, I think I completely agree, but it's a really difficult issue. You know, in the work that, that I do in COPOS, you know, there are uh, a number of delegations who will continually remind us that this is an intergovernmental process. And, you know, decisions are made by countries and, you know, and so um, Martin and, uh, and Torsten are well aware of this, you know, we sort of, dancing on eggshells to a certain degree to get that information, that dialogue with expertise that are not states, because states, of course, don't have all the expertise. Um, Torsten, I was going to ask you, because um, uh, Martin... Just, just a second, oh, please. Yeah. please. Uh, yeah. one, one, one point on that. I, I agree that it's important to, to get the expertise and, and to talk to the private sector and uh, like, like you have to talk to the people who are actually uh, working in that environment or, or using space, um, doing space activities. But I think it's equally important uh, to keep in mind that uh, the, the private actors should in the end not be the ones making the rules. So, um, and, and, and that's why it, I don't really sympathize with the uh, complete uh, ignorance about private actors, but I um, do have some concerns about too much involvement of private actors, because if it's more than the experience sharing and you see that uh, private actors are, are basically writing laws and they're just passed mm -hmm. through by some, yeah. some government bodies, whatever, I think that that is wrong because it, it's okay and, and it's it, it's a jo the job of the private actors to look at how can we make money of it and, and what's our business case and to push that. But then it's uh, equally important that um, the, the, the rulemaking, be it states on the international level or parliament uh, and, and governments on a national level, that they are like the counterpart bringing in uh, the community interest so uh, that, that there will be a balanced uh, outcome and a balanced regulation. Yeah, yeah I agree. Are you... I agree. I agree completely. But I think the point is still there that, uh, and, and we all know this, on because this technology is moving so quickly and because in many countries, not all, the technology is essentially being driven by the private sector, who obviously then work with governments, we need to, you know, I agree the rulemaking on the really big issues are for the states, but they have to be informed informed about what's going on. And, and that's where I think this dialogue is important. I, I agree that we've got to keep the vested interests of the private sector away from the rulemaking. But on the other hand, uh, as I always say to my first year students, you've got to understand the questions before you can come up with the answers. And it's really the private sector more and more that will help us understand the questions. I mean, Torsten, what's your take on this? You know, you you see it all, right? Uh, you, you know, I love you dearly. You tend, I think, to be cynical of the guts intergovernmental process. And you tend, I think, to follow the way that the private sector is moving. But would you agree with Martin's point and Anne's point and my point about rulemaking itself on the big issues still would be with the countries, but they need to understand the technical issues? Or do you have a different take on that? I don't know. I, I even don't know what cynical is and how you write it. But <laughs> <laughs> let's put that. that uh, point aside 
I think you you all nailed it, nailed it uh, from from your point of view. Ab absolutely, um, I think that technology is leaping. It's not just developing. It's leaping so fast that neither regulation nor the governmental bodies are having a chance to following it up. So, and so that that's a gap. So we have we have two. In my opinion, there there are two ways we can strictly regulate it and forbid everything until it is allowed. What then kills private um, innovation? What is at the moment so much fostered worldwide and every country, every coordinator talks about innovation here, innovation there, space is super for that, la la la. We, we, we all have heard it and then cutting budgets, but it's, it's just a side note. <laughs> How, however, um, we, See other examples, um, and I will be in um, in Andoya uh, at the spaceport or at the you know, spaceport Andoya in two weeks. And I checked a bit. Why can they launch? Why do they have the license or will have the license to launch from there? Because the, it is regulated that everything what can launch what can be launched safely from there is allowed. So that's a very short version, but it's super open. If you convince them that what you do is safe, then you can launch. I think that's a great way forward. So you allow it under circum, uh, under some circumstances. And yes, I'm not a lawyer, not at all. Um, but I think that could be drive or help us um, in the understanding of technology. We got one question here from, or a, a side mark uh, from, from, from LinkedIn, from my friend Maydat, and he said, are you guys talking about the, the, the white elephant in the room as well? The mega constellations in that, the, the starlings, the court boss, and so on. I say, yeah, we will. We, ca we come to that. But we see here Elon with his 5,000 satellites. I mean, it is, it is legal. Is that right? That has not to do with, 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 with being legal. But is that safe? Question marks. I mean, yesterday I, I read an article that 200 of, this, of his satellites are dying. So, and that's an enormous number. I mean, it's a, it's a fraction from this 5,000, but it's still it's an enormous number and it causes a lot of threats. Well, it can cause. So, and I think we, ha we have to find this, this dialogue and um, what, what you guys are doing is, is absolutely fantastic uh, with your work. You, 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 you're inviting to this dialogue to find a consensus on that. Yeah, I, you it's, may it takes add one too, thing too long. Sorry for my yeah. Martin, yes. It, so um, I, I really like the example of Norway because uh, what they, they have like what I believe is the oldest space national space law in the world, but, but one of the oldest. And uh, basically that, that, that space law says everything's forbidden, but you can get uh, an uh, exceptionary permit. And, and that what you described, Torsten, is uh, more, more the approach they're taking to those permits. They're saying, okay, um, if, if you provide some proof and, and we are confident that it is safe, you can launch. And um, that is uh, what, what I think is, is the beauty also of, of the international space law. The, the rules are very broad. Yes, that uh, gives us a lot to discuss at Copius Stevens <laughs> because uh, <laughs> it's often a bit ambitious or there are different interpretations. But, but, but that's really what, what uh, caught my interest and, and why I uh, get stuck with space law and I'm and, and, um, and still so passionate about it. Mm -hmm. You have this treaty from 1967, uh, so which, which was uh, they started negotiating it end of the 50s after uh, Sputnik was launched, but you, it was done with so much foresight and, and you can still, uh, with, with all those uh, uh, challenges you have with coming to a common interpretation, but you can still use those treaties and uh, you do not need to, to make, uh, so it would be good to have some new treaties for new aspects, but like what is already regulated in those treaties, you do not to say, okay, they are old, we start from scratch. You can build upon that and yeah. uh, further develop the rules that are already there. 
Yeah, look, there's so much to unpick here, and I've got we we always run out of time. Firstly, on Norway, um, I, I have to declare my interest. I've been working with the Norwegian government for uh, for an update of their legislation, and there's a draft law in their parliament now. So yes, that really old four paragraph legislation that Norway has may well change sometime in the future. We shall see. Um, but I just want to unpick what's being said. Firstly, on technology, and then on constellations and the concept of failure. So maybe on the on the technology side first, you know, and you're at the forefront of technology. Um, we see more and more, you know, every day I'm being asked to comment on the incorporation of uh, AI and technology into space, the use of quantum technology in space missions, you know, and obviously that'll help us in our efficiencies. There are obviously benefits. Rivada's using uh, cutting edge technology, but there are questions there going back to what Martin's saying about, you know, liability and accountability when things go wrong and inevitably things do go wrong. So, and do you foresee that we'll have fully automated space systems and fully automated? Uh, and how will these be regulated with humans, in a sense, really not in the loop? And is that a good or a bad thing? Uh, Anne, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, first of all, I, 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 I'd like to, 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 to say that from that we work from the principle that failure is not an option. It's not like we're going to put some things out there and if and we, we put up tens of thousands up, up there and if some of them fail, then we'll deal with them afterwards. That is not that is not the school of thought I adhere to, nor the company I work for uh, adhere to. It's it's more like we need to be responsible, not because that's that's in the rules. We need to be responsible, not because we have to, but because it's the right thing to do. And we have a big self-interest to do that because we got, we know the mega constellation. We're just 600, 600 satellites, um, you know, which is a tall, a tall number still, but it's not a not a not a mega con constellation. It's it's a manageable number, and we we want to to um, um, to to use the T word three times over, which is test, test, and test. So we're not putting up anything up there and we're having a, the word you also used, Martin, before, a holistic approach to things. It's from the moment we conceive something over the production process, over the, the launch process, over the in-orbit raising process, over the operational process. As a holistic approach, it's all about having having tested things and managing things so well. Of course, the, the difficulty is in um, dealing with the unpredictable. So, just one word, uh, uh, as as uh, I want to say, um, on for example, our our um, the way we will produce it. it it's not like we're going to tr throw lots of bodies on on producing these 600 satellites our manufacturer will will learn a lot from the automation processes in the automotive um, um, uh, world and we will have everything we want we, we aspire to have a quality control where if somebody wants to pick up a, a tool and put the wrong screw in the wrong in the wrong part of the the satellite build that it simply doesn't work and that it's properly documented that at this time of time of of the day this person put this kind of screw with this type of equipment in this hole in this satellite that goes up at that time so we really want to to drive it very very far in our quality control in our testing to to you know to be as responsible as 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 we can then of course we need to manage the unpredictable and of course artificial intelligence is a, is a tool we are looking at um, at 
uh, implementing to assist us with uh, uh, with that to to a certain to a certain degree, and all the other words which were used um, before, which is space situation of uh, awareness, um, collision avoidance, deorbiting. We disagree with the rule that you need to deorbit within twenty five years. That's absurd. Even the five-year rule of the FCC, we believe that we can do better and we will do better because it's the responsible thing to do. Because if everybody is responsible and doesn't pollute the nest, then it's a clean nest for all the birds that need to, 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 hatch, to hatch in it. Yeah, and look, it gets back to failure. You know, we heard Torsten... Uh, talking to us about uh, someone from LinkedIn and then, you know, the who was talking about Starlink and the 200 dying satellites. Martin, you know, you and I and everybody knows space is hard. Yeah. And there's inevitably failures along the way to success, right? There, there has to be because we just don't know. As, as uh, Anne said, there's a lot of unpredictability about space. So, how do we, how do I, I, you know, how do we address failure? Given what Anne, the point that Anne is making, and the point that you're making, that we have to be responsible, and you know, the the move towards miniaturization has, I've said this in previous breakfasts, changed the thinking of some of the operators. Where you know, if you have your three hundred million dollar geo satellite, failure is certainly not an option, right? Because you've got one shot. If it doesn't work, you know, three you get your insurance, but three you've got no program. When you're sending up thousands and thousands of satellites, you've obviously got redundancies and resilience. And if they, let's say, ten percent don't operate, well, that's fine, right? That's the price you pay. So. Our thinking about failure has changed. Um, how do we explain failure to governments? How in your capacity building do you talk to countries about the need to develop in a responsible way and yet things will go wrong before you have success? It's a really difficult conundrum, isn't it? You're on mute, Matt. Yeah, right. Yes, yes. Um... So um, I think it's um, it's important to to communicate uh, transparently about that, and uh, to communicate in a transparent uh, and appropriate way just from the start. So, um, like in in Europe, we have a lot of the discussions about why are we burning money in space, and it's everything so expensive. And um, if I recall correctly, it was uh, Jan Werner uh, who, when he uh, uh, got the, the position of uh, ESA DG, started to do a lot about uh, showcasing the return on investment uh, that, that is uh, gained from outer space. And um, then, so, so really show the chances you have. Also, be, be transparent about the risks. I mean, there are still risks. You will not just uh, build a satellite and it will, uh, or th there's not a um, guarantee that it will work right away, uh, even if you, if you do not build it yourself, but buy it from uh, some established company. Um, I mean, there has been, I think it was Firefly, if I recall correctly, uh, who had uh, some launch failure um, or, some other company, um, it can always happen. You you never know. It was Rocket Labs. Even, Rocket Labs, okay. Um, thank you, Torsten. And um, so you, you always have to communicate that and, and find the right balance between talking about the risks and praise your activities. So, so when it comes to communication, SpaceX is often cited as like the, or Elon Musk as a prime example of how good, uh, communication works but honestly i think it's not really good communication he's good on showing off the success but the uh, part of being transparent about uh, the risks and uh, talking openly about uh, failures that is kind of missing so no matter what you always see them applauding and they're 
like uh, was a starship uh, they they still said well so great we got so many data and so on um that that's true but that's from my point of view not appropriate because he uh, they they did not really communicate about um why it went wrong and maybe that it was not so good an idea to just have a a rather thin plate of concrete and no fire trenches and what is usually built at a launch site you know and he they just skipped the whole part about um, where they to save money had uh, less less safety maybe or, or less uh, redundancy and and you have to wait out both because that's how you get the public on your side in the end, especially as a government, when, when you have to justify why are you spending money on it. And um, it's and, and then if, if you have to be reasonable and, and realistic in, in setting your goals uh, and then maybe start with a CubeSat and not with a big geostationary satellite if uh, you're an emerging spacefaring country. And uh, I think it's more and more important and, and um, what what N says uh, supports that a bit um, that you know like even operators where you always say okay they just want to make money they don't care about sustainability uh, so I'm not looking at you and please don't get me wrong <laughs> uh, so so now on the operator side they're recognizing okay we have to use this environment and that might be uh, the, the the first step and, and, and the most important step to avoid the tragedy of the commons in outer space. And um, as, as public is more and more aware of sustainability uh, on Earth, I think they will be about sustainability in space. So um, states should always also bear that in mind, the, the, the responsibility for the outer space environment and the long-term sustainability, and then find a way to communicate transparently and appropriately about risks and chances and why are we still doing it and and what what is our goal what do we want to reach and and that really calls calls for honest open dialogue between government regulators and the private sector the private sector there's so much hype that goes on because people want to raise money and for investors so and uh, martin was not talking about rivada and and you've already told us that your company uh, and you have a, a, a view of responsibility. So what lessons, you know, what do you see in the market and what lessons can you pass on to some of the other private sector companies who perhaps don't have the same view? I mean, uh, is it that they have short-term vi vision and you have long-term vision? Is it because they are, you know, profit oriented and you are community oriented and you'd like to make money i mean what lessons do you pass on to your i don't mean your competitors but to the industry the industry because you want to see the industry continue to thrive because that will also create an environment where you can thrive so what what do you say to the other companies when you get together um when the first thing we say is we need to have an honest dialogue here and this is not positioning we we shouldn't use this dialogue among operators to position ourselves from a from a, com, a competition point of view so the the gso sector is perhaps a bit squeezed or feels perhaps a bit squeezed by the newcomers in the NGO NGSO sectors and and may want to try and influence certain regulatory parameters to constrain the NGSO sector. But our our message is always look, we need to talk here on um to to because we have a common goal here and it's not a competition play to try and 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 uh, um and and influence regulators to put more stringent requirements um to preserve um a, 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 a competition play a space in competition so that's that always is our our and 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 to be fair um if you 
there is a lot of dialogue, a lot of conversations. There, there are associations of, uh, of, sat of private sector operators and those discussions are going on very, very much there, like on industry self-regulation. Because if we can agree among each other and together make us into not a few responsible operators, but a responsible sector, then it actually makes the need for regulation less. And then you know it 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 it's actually a, a good a good a good exercise good exercise. So we're actually putting a lot of effort in those in those forums. And then also we are supporting regulators who like if the FCC would say tomorrow you need to deorbit in in two years, we're going to be fully behind behind that. Mm. We, we're not going to going to try and 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 stretch that. And and what I always want to say, also want to say, is that the the dialogue between the regulatory people of um, of private sector operators, they're they very they. So we, we operators compete fiercely with each other on the commercial field, but it is possible for their regulatory people to set aside that that competition and to come to 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 a view um, where um, you know it it um, a consensus view on on as I said what 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 is what is what is responsible. The one thing I do want to say is that. Very often, when um, operators or space actors, private space actors, come together, it's a coalition of the willing. And then mm. those who who would like to do the worst excesses do not come to the to the table. So yeah, that's that, and that's where probably the institution, the the, the international institutional framework, UNCPOS, um, where there are nations, space nations, who may have a very different attitude to to risk. You know, that that is then something that needs to work via the peer pressure at uh, at the international at the international level. So everybody does their part at at their level. Thorsten, thank you, Anne. The, the really interesting and, and helpful. Thorsten, you know, reality check. Is the private sector listening to Anne and Martin? Um, is the space private sector going to be the survival of the responsible or the survival of the, the wealthy uh, who perhaps aren't as responsible and are not pointing to any particular, but in hypotheticals, may not be as responsible, but have deeper checkbooks, you know. Is the private sector getting the message that they have more in common to be responsible than they have to take short-term views? Or do you, do you see still that capitalistic private sector, I've got to win, I've got to withhold information, I've got to be the first, I've got to be the best, I've got to get rid of the competition. Is that the mentality? What do you see, Torsten? You speak to them all the time. I love your easy questions. So, <laughs> uh, um, if you heard some some noise, then it was the dropping of my crystal ball, which I <laughs> fell down from the from my table here and ro rolled off. Um, now, coming back to your to, to your point, um, and I'm not one to jump on the capitalism is bad thing. Um, yeah, yeah. Not at all. I think that most companies that are putting serious constellations in space, considering this environment to be safe, because they see the risk because they're all in the same boat. I mean, if you're in a, in a, in a Formula One car bus, and you you're running against the wall, then you all are, are affected by that. So and I mean, if Kessler will kick kick off in a larger scale. I mean, it, it exists already, but in a larger scale, then everyone is uh, sooner or later affected by that. So I think that is something that came along. And when you talk with, and, or when you hear 
uh, in the SSA conversation and Amos is going on as, as we speak uh, on Hawaii, um, you have all the big players there. So, and they all talk about their responsibility. And yes, also Starling um, saying and claiming for them, yes, we are responsible. We're doing that, that, and that for the, for the astronomers, for the space traffic management, for here, for there. So they all try to play well, but who am I to judge if that's really right or not? Yeah. So, and I think we, we, we need a kind of organization that really monitors that from an independent point of view, which is not connected to the private sector. And that has to be an institutional one. Um, I, I, I love the, I mean, I, I, I had the chance to delve more in, uh, into what, what Rivada is doing and the sustainability approach. And I say, that's great. That's super good. If that comes to play, if that is really conveyed at the end or put in, in, in space, yeah, and failure is not an option. It is nice to say, but it is not the reality. Failure always can happen. It, it doesn't have to be caused by you. I mean, see the latest news we got from clear space. Their object they want to capture was hit by, by space <laughs> debris. I mean, you can't think of all these uh, potential cases that can happen. It doesn't have to be your fault that things go wrong, but this, but that can happen. And I think this this dialogue, and I'm happy to see this dialogue. It, it is based um, debris conversation four years ago, five years ago, did not exist in reality. It just occurred in the last years. With also with the pandemic and our, we had with the, the conversations with with Moriba Ja and and all of the others, the Leo Labs of the world also, and they're bringing it up. And now we are there. We have this this open dialogue, and that's part. It's it was great to see at the World Satellite Business Forum that the IETU uh, had. Her core message was space sustainability. Not spectrum allocation, not the fight of all of that. That's that's done. That's uh, we are there. But sustainability is a very big thing, and that's that's for me a good sign. So, come back to your question: Does all the privates listen to what Martin and and Anne says? I hope so. I hope so. And we have a good number of of people here in the audience, and we publish that. But we will see. Uh, at the end. Listening, talking about it, and acting responsible are three different steps. And yeah, I to to all of and, us that have kids or grandchildren that that know what I'm talking about. So promising and doing other things is is not uncommon. Yeah, and we see that at the intergovernmental level. Yeah. I mean, wonderful conversations, but sometimes you get the impression that that the conversation is the beginning and the end. And so you're right, we really need to get that mindset of common interests, common interests amongst states, common interests amongst all the players, because I, as you say, we all lose out if we get it wrong, right? I, I think we, we had um, a changing conversation over the years when the private sector talked about base sustainability as, hmm, we have to do that because to secure our business. And I think this approach is wrong. That is logic, but it's wrong. It's totally wrong. So we have to secure the environment first, not making mistake humanity has done over the last 500 years, thousand years of industrialization, it might be even not that long, but uh, polluting air, polluting uh, um, the oceans and so on and so forth and so on and so forth. And now we are seeing the results. I mean, climate change is real. I mean, we all experience it this, this, this summer on the, the summers to come. It will not change. We have to adapt to that. But that is wrong. Adaptation is just consequences of not um, fighting the courses before. And I think Agreed. in space, we still have the chance, but this window is, is closing. And I don't talk about star, um, Starship popping up and and being successful, but uh, I think from the sustainability point of view, that can be very challenging um, to to see. And I'm happy to see the scarcity of, of launch opportunities at the moment. I don't want to see a launch every day or every second day. Yeah. 
Agreed. Let's let let's move on. <laughs> Time's up. We've still got Anne and Martin, and we want to use every bit of their knowledge. Yes. So we've got some questions, Torsten. Oh yes. Um, do you want to? Yeah. Do you want to direct some questions to uh, Anne and Martin, and uh, we'll see what uh, they can sing for their supper here, or sing for their breakfast, I mean, really. Our, yeah. Our very informed audience is is coming up with questions like you ask are. Um, Stephen, so very complex uh, from time to time. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> with, 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 with the, um, with, I hope that we can get some in a, in, a, in a few minutes to answer. So Mark asks, do we need a supranational space organization, improve ITU and UNOSA, or can technical rules like the ITS guidelines and national space and standards laws close the gaps? Oh, great question. Martin, and over to you. I mean, do we need to fix the problem from the top down or from the bottom up or I mean how whatever gaps there are and clearly there are gaps where do we where do we look to augment or change in some way shape or form the way we regulate at either the international or national level Martin and your thoughts Martin um well in if, if we talk about uh, space traffic management, for example, um, but there's a lot talk mm -hmm. about the ICAO of space or something like that. And um, probably uh, it will be needed at some point. But I think that right now it's, it's too early because we do not have the, the basic rules yet. You know, ICAO was set up with the Chicago Convention where they also decided on the basic rules for, for, for air traffic or further developed what, what was already out there. Um, and um, I mean, there's a lot talk about, about the future role of ITU, the future role of UNOSA. I, I'm, I'm, I don't want to dive into, the, uh, dive into that. that that's uh, another hour long discussion. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, yes, so, so at some point, um, we probably should establish such an organization um, just to to uh, try to have uh, not not necessarily the, the frequency management uh, to, to take that from ITU but to have uh, the the space traffic management in in, uh, in a some centralized way um, maybe not all levels but but uh, you, you can still think about uh, Certain communications uh, being done via some uh, sector organization, but uh, the, the general management, uh, looking at general rules, um, it would be helpful to have an organization for that, especially because um, you cannot put everything into law. You know, um, and mentioned the um, uh, space debris mitigation guidelines and, and the deorbiting limits. So 25 uh, year rule, now FCC five year rule. The, the problem with having such concrete time limits in, in any kind of law or, or um, governmental regulation is that it takes a lot of time from the first draft to adopting it and uh, it entering into force. And it'll take a long time to change that again. So those um, standards, uh, be it industry or IADC or whatever, are really uh, helpful to to make the more general rules that are in treaties and, and, and national regulations um, to make them really applicable for from an engineering point of view. So um, yes, standards are necessary and helpful. Uh, that the law can be a bit more, um, I don't want to call it ambitious, but uh, a bit more open, not not naming a time limit, but maybe saying uh, should be deorbited in an appropriate time frame. And then the, the industry uh, it knows best what, what is possible and uh, maybe some um, NGOs focusing on the environmental part should uh, be involved in the discussion so that, that you have a bit of a balance between those 
looking at the purely environmental part and those looking at it also with, with the business part and, and what's economically viable. And then they can come to, to the conclusion much quicker than states can for some international instrument. Yeah, I think that's a great answer. Uh, we, I want to take one more question, Torsten. Uh, but, and just quickly, just responding to that, you said in your comments before, you know, if we can encourage responsible behaviour amongst the private sector, the operators, and have a bit of self-regulation, that may mitigate the need for more, if you like, formal regulation. Um, so clearly, in a sense, we want to avoid regulating for the sake of regulation, but but really, can you know, can we really rely on self-regulation? Uh, as an answer, or do we need to augment that anyway with more regulation in uh, in what areas? Yeah, Martin, Martin said it super well, actually. You need both. And there is somewhere where where international law stops and 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 the the, the practice among operators uh, where to, you know where where that line is between the two, that's that's unclear at 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 the moment. That line is still being uh, uh, being established, and it's it's a it as Martin said, it's super good that international international law abhors a vacuum. International law is is formulated in a way that it fills a vacuum because it has general rules. I wanted to give the the, the example of um, avoidance of interference in spectrum <clears throat> as a bit of an analogy to avoidance of collisions in, in space. However, however many rules there are, and, and Martin said it, you can't actually put rules on, on everything. You can have a rule to say um, operators cannot interfere with each other operators need to have a system in place for collision avoidance. So they, these broad principles have to be uh, put in, in international law. But then, of course, how it's the people who fly the satellites that on a day-to-day -day basis need to implement the collision avoidance. And it's the people who are operating the, the system that on a day-to-day -day basis need to um, um, operate a system so it doesn't create interference and it needs also to pick up when interference is created and tell others to tune it down because they are creating interference with somebody else. So on a day-to-day -day basis, there, there will be a lot of contact between the, the operators um, uh, as much as there is the the you know the, the 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 interference avoidance system and and complaints procedures among each other that same thing will happen in in collision avoidance there needs to be an obligation to share information but when there is um uh, uh, an accident waiting to happen action needs to be taken and then you know you sort out afterwards who should have been avoided, avoiding whom. But ultimately, that's the way it has to, to go. General rules. Mm -hmm. But then, then in, in practice, actually do what it takes to avoid interference, to avoid collisions, uh, share information, um, and have the hands on the buttons. Oh, yeah, I think that's right. Torsten, you're, I'm in your hands. We have time for one more question. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, because it's it's a question I also want to take as a hook for a further uh, for an uh, upcoming episode that we have. And uh, John Burley uh, from from Cambridge um, came in quite came in late, uh, and it, I think he is a first time visitor of our, our show. What is what is great? So we got a new welcome, John. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Um, he put a long uh, question in, but uh, with with a very short question. So um, I. He asked, I've been taking a keen interest in developments in space-based solar, um, space -based solar power. Several companies are taking first steps, dem dem demonstrators and so on, and they continue 
RF spectrum. For this technology to have a chance, we might need to completely revisit the ITU or the international regulations on both frequency al allocation and orbit allocation. So geosynchronous uh, orbits are currently precious real estate for communication and Earth observation. Both could be disrupted by a technology to deliver decarbonization for our energy needs. So his question is, is this a hot topic in the space legal domain? And if not, who are the early voices and how do we make sure the conversation is happening in a balanced way? And I know it's a bit of off topic, but I think it interferes here definitely with, with both of, of your angles. Over to yeah, you. Well, yeah, and from the ITU perspective, you know, so the, the technology towards uh, space solar power generation, et cetera, and the usages, is the ITU looking at that at all? And should they be now? Well, it's a great time to, to ask that. I am, I am telling everybody I know that between the 20th of November and the 16th of December, my plants are not going to get watered. I'm away in Dubai with 3,000 other experts to the World Radio Conference. So this is a, a big event that <laughs> happens happens every four years. And, and actually, if we have the conception that uh, uh, regulators are not technically informed if you go there, you probably will, will come back with a very, very different view and say, well, all these regulators, they really, really have highly capable technical experts. And uh, every four years, they lock all of these geeks um, in a, a big conference center for four or five weeks, and they need to come out of that with um, some revisions of the radio regulations and yes that is one one of the topics i do like the approach of the it and international law in 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 general and and, and martin martin alluded to it too um from the outside it looks like watching paint dry but from the inside it really looks like a very careful approach with huge passionate debates to balance all the interests at stake. And Martin says that very well too. Private industry can't plead its case, but ultimately, and that's a good thing, is the regulators that strike the balance. Mm. And um, I've done too many WRCs. I've got too many scars from them. So um, I'm going to go to to another one, even though I had sworn never to do that in <laughs> 2019, um, and and I'm I'm sure um, we'll come out of there totally exhausted, having talked about many 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 um, subjects, including the one um, which which is which is which is in what the question was was about. Um, but Dollar. it's yeah. not going, so the, the way the process works is actually very balanced and very careful. And nobody ever loses if you're real. If, if, the, if the, the world there, the, the, the WRC, if there's a belief by the regulators that this is something that needs to be enabled, they will find a, a solution for it. And But often, it's a cycle of eight years to 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 do that. So yes, but um, I'm I'm sure ITU is looking looking at it, which is a good thing. Um, new regulation and changing a footnote takes four years, and having a paradigm shift probably takes a little bit longer. Yeah, and and Martin, from the COPWAS viewpoint, you know, and particularly in the SDSC. Is this an issue that is of importance and, and how will that process go, do you think? Um, well, at, at the SDSC, I think there have been presentations on it, uh, yeah. but it, I do not recall it being uh, 
deeply discuss um, and and uh, as, as the question aims at, at the international law, uh, I do not recall uh, it being discussed at, at the LSC. And um, what so if if you look at radio regulations, for example, th those might to be changed uh, and talked a lot about that. I don't have to repeat it, but um, I do not see that to implement space-based solar power, you have to completely revisit international law uh, on it. The, the, the framework does allow for it. So uh, radio regulation might be an issue. I'm, I'm not too familiar with it, so, so I cannot really um, judge on it. But, but uh, the, the framework that we do have in general um, is, uh, from my point of view, um, sufficient. And, and, we, and that's how I understood N as well, that there is a way to deal with it within the ITU framework. So you do not need to change that framework, but like just do the little tweaks on, on the more technical side. Yeah, thank you. And it's also... Uh, John, a, a question of priorities as well, right? You know, the international community struggles sometimes to look in this area at three or four different pressing issues at the same time. They sort of prioritize. And so um, to the, this is an important issue. There are other important issues. We've got to get it up that line. Look, we're way over time as always, yes. um, but it's just been a wonderful, wonderful discussion. Martin and Anne, Thank you, thank you so much. You know, you have enlightened us so much in this wonderful surrounding in Bonn. Um, I wish we had more time for coffee and bushstool and pretzels and and uh, but we will meet again in person. And I'll be in Dubai, I think, during that same period for other reasons. So anyway, we'll be as so Torsten. Um, you know, over to you. Uh, we can talk about our next programs uh, and and uh, but Anne and Martin, thank you. It's been just wonderful to have it you. It was a delight, talk. and you know, a good breakfast that sets one up for. The <laughs> well, for me, for me, it's dinner. It's dinner time where I am, of course. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was a fantastic conversation. Thank you very much. And, and thank you very much, everyone in the audience for staying that long with us. So we are, we had uh, almost 30 people on LinkedIn and are so that's that's really big numbers. And as um, Stephen said, we would like to invite you um, for the 25th of January, I think that is um, one of the dates um, that will be our next uh, regular Space Cafe Law Breakfast with Anne-Sophie Martin and uh, Duncan Blake at the moment. Um, but before, uh, uh -oh. as you say, wait, wait a second, we have September now and what happened in November as Stephen it will be super busy at that point of time. So we agreed to do a special for you. So we will wrap up and recap the last 15 breakfasts with our thoughts and maybe doing the Waldorf and Stettler thing um, on, on our commentary. <laughs> we, will, we will see how that goes. So stay tuned. It will come to you before Christmas. Um, but um, now I have a few more, not just one slide, not a few more slides for, for you. Before we end this wonderful conversation here, uh, I would like to invite all of you for this afternoon um, at 4 p.m. Central European time for our next Space Cafe Israel by the wonderful Maida Poyente. And for his second season, he made it possible to talk with the uh, new head of, or with the head of the Israel Space Agency, Uri Oron, what is really a, an, an, an outstanding achievement uh, and recognition of our shows as well. Next week, uh, we will start with, um, on, on Tuesday, and you see it's, it's Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So we give you a full week of program with a next space arbitration session by Laura Zielinski. And she will have a look on Africa. So we will have uh, Josh, we have Joanne from Kenya, and we have Rubimbu again in, in the show. Um, then on the 27th, we have our next Space Cafe law, uh, not law, uh, Black Ops by um, Emma Gatti together with Namrata Goswami. And I think... Their topic at the moment for this show will be India and the new space policy in India and the achievements of, of India in the geopolitical context. Also wrapping up what happened in, in South Africa and so on and so forth. 
then followed by the next space cafe lob uh lob rocket again so i'm so in in this program here today <laughs> with heike and she will talk um to or the head of cybersecurity at the belgium our defense our space defense office um that's also very interesting on the same day the next space bar by astro agency will happen where we do the news part and then on the 29th the next space cafe scotland by angela matisse will happen all these events are going to be on eventbrite as always we would like to hear your feedback so please check in with us on twitter on facebook or linkedin for the new generation twitter is what you call now x but that's just for 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 stake um don't forget to sign into our daily or bi-weekly newsletter and if you like to treat yourself with something special become a space watcher today we need your support to keep our work going thank you very much for your interest today and thank you Anne and uh martin um it was a wonderful program Stephen. as always uh, it was super fantastic uh, are you happy i think that's oh, just a rhetorical question isn't it i am i am it it just as I said, it just gets better and better. And I can't wait. As you said, um, we'll be meeting two wonderful people in January in Rome, I think, which will be lovely. But before that, uh, Torsten and I will uh, get our heads together and recap 15. We'll recap 30 words on space. We'll recap all of the thoughts. Um, we'll decide that'll probably be sometime sometime in december so please we'll let you know about that but thank you everybody martin and have a wonderful wonderful uh uh weekend and uh it's just been great torsten thank you and mm -hmm. i'm must show you of course i'm wearing your space watcher shirt again so wonderful kit thank you very much so Thank you everyone for, for joining us. Thank you for your interest. Um, I hope you all would stay safe and stay healthy. And uh, again, thanks for joining. Um, see you later today, maybe next week. In the meantime, visit our website and follow us on social media. And don't forget to become a space watcher. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Take care. Bye. 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 Bye.